All right, the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24. If you found your place, let's stand together, please, out of love and respect for the Word of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24. All right, the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24. And uh, we're going to pick up our reading in verse number 36. Gospel of Luke 24. And we're going to pick up our reading in verse number 36. The Bible says this, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Then and he, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the law of prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and arise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Look back at verse 47, please. The Bible says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Last week, I, or week before last, I preached on making missions matter. And this morning, I'm going to be preaching on this thought, making missions possible. Making missions possible. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you again for these people that have gathered here today to hear your word Lord, I thank you for everything that's going on, Lord, in this service. And Father, I would ask you this morning that as we go forward in this place, Lord, trying to preach your word, God, that you would be with me and God, you would help me that I might preach the word of God. Lord, I do want to be a blessing and God, I do want to be a help uh, to these folks that are gathered here today. And Lord, I do want to impart to them biblically how both they and I can make missions possible in our day. And so Lord, as we begin in, uh, here in Luke chapter number 24... And God, as we look at several passages of Scripture, I pray that as we turn page to page that you would illuminate our hearts and minds to the Word of God. Lord, we sure do need to hear from you. God, we need to hear you speak in the message. For Lord, I do not have the ability to give these folks what they need. But I do know that if the Holy Spirit would only speak in this service today, God, that you could do in every heart that which you desire to do. And so, Father, for the next few moments as we're gathered into this place, God, I pray that you would help us to listen for the Holy Spirit of God that he might do a work in this place. Father, I pray this morning if there might be one that is gathered here that's not sure that they have ever experienced the remission of their sins. God, if there's some that might be in this congregation today that have never truly believed on Christ, God, I pray today would be the day that that event would take place in their lives. And God, for your people, I do pray again for the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit of God, Lord, that they might see truth in the Scriptures and then, Lord, through the help of the Holy Spirit to humble themselves before the Word of God. And Lord, I pray when the invitation time is given, you'll give us fruit around these altars, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. In our text that we read this morning, the resurrected Lord Jesus has appeared to His disciples. And in this meeting, two things have taken place. 
First of all, Jesus Christ confirmed his disciples. Look there in verse number 36 of our text. The Bible says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So here are a group of disciples. They are very discouraged because things had not worked out the way that they thought in their plan that things ought to have worked out. The Lord Jesus went to the cross. They thought the Lord should have immediately set up a kingdom and they were to immediately rule with Jesus Christ. So things didn't work out the way that they thought it ought. And now they're together, they're discouraged, they're broken because uh, the Lord Jesus had died and that he was placed in that cold grave. When you get to verse number 36, we find that Jesus appears to his disciples. And here in this appearance, he's going to do two things. He's going to confirm their faith and he's going to dispel their doubt. So when Jesus comes, this heartbroken group of doubting disciples are there and Jesus is going to come along and he's going to help them to see that he is who he said he was and that he is indeed risen from the dead. Now after Jesus appears the very first word, the words that he speaks to these disciples is peace be unto you. Why did he speak peace be unto you? Look at verse 37. It says but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And so the Lord Jesus appeared to them and he gave them, if you will, visible proof. Not only did he speak to them, he showed them the signs of his resurrection. He said, look, it's me. You can see my hands. You can see my feet. You can see the wounds that are there. You can see that it is I and that it's not a spirit. But notice in verse 41 that they were still doubting. And so Jesus goes forward to confirm them even more. In verse 41, the Bible says, And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it, and did he before them. And so notice here Jesus is uh, confirming to the hearts of his disciples that he is who he said he was. He tells them in these verses that he's the one. He's the resurrected Savior. And he shows them his hands and his feet. And they were worried that he was still a spirit. So Jesus took another step and he actually ate in front of them showing them that if he were a spirit he wouldn't be able to do that. You say why is Jesus going to such great lengths to confirm to his disciples that it is him. Because listen, these disciples were men just like you and I are. Men who sometimes have the deepest doubts about things. And the Lord had to confirm to them that he had actually risen like he said because that was going to be the cornerstone of the message that they were going to preach. Hey, that Jesus came and that he died, that he was buried. And then after three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead. And so here he's confirming his disciples' faith. You know, isn't it true that after you get saved, I don't know if you were exactly like I was, but after I got saved, there were some doubts that began to creep into my heart and mind. And it was a wonderful day in my Christian life when the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, confirmed in my soul that I was a child of God. What a blessing that was. I remember after being saved, the great battle that I was having in my soul. After I got gotten in church and began to go to Sunday school and church and all those things, I remember wondering, did I really get saved? And it was something that I struggled with for a little while. But what a blessing it was that day whenever in my soul it was confirmed to me by the Spirit of God through the word of God that I was a child of God and I will tell you this 100% fact that I ne- have never doubted since that moment in time God confirmed it to my soul that I did believe on Christ 
I'm thankful for the confirming work of the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so the Holy Spirit of God reveals to us if we've not been saved. This morning, if you have doubts in your hearts and minds, can I ask you this morning to allow the Spirit of God to reveal to you if you've ever really been born again? Hey, He will do that. That is one of the works that uh, the Spirit of God does. He shows you whether you're saved or whether you're lost and I'm thankful that if you're saved he can confirm to you that he is uh, that you are a child of God now remember in the end of the book of John the spirit of God has not been dispatched yet he is not indwelling believers like he does right now to us. This is a time, if you will, between the Testaments and the Spirit of God was still coming upon believers, but it was not sealing believers like we find in Acts chapter 2 and forward. It was a different uh, time, if you will. And you know what? These disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of them like you and I do to confirm them. So here's Jesus. Did not Jesus say that he was going to send another comforter, meaning one like himself? And so that's the Spirit of God. He was going to send him. And thank God he did send him. And that confirms to us our salvation. But in this time Jesus had to come because the Spirit had not yet descended and indwelt and kept like the Bible talks about. And so what we find here is that the Holy Spirit of God is confirming to the hearts of his disciples the truth of the resurrection and the truth of salvation. So we see the disciples, Jesus came to confirm them and to show them that, you know, everything is as I said. Look at verse number 44. He even uses scriptures. Not only did he show them the signs of his hands and feet, but he uses scriptures to prove that everything has happened according to the plan of God. The Bible says in verse number 44, And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Jesus is saying this. It's just like the Bible foretold. It's just like Moses foretold in the Old Testament Scripture. Everything that's fallen unto us has happened according to the, uh, the Word of God, according to God's plan. Verse 45 then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And so what is Jesus doing in these verses? He's confirming to his disciples that everything is exactly how God planned it to be. You know, it's a blessing in a Christian's life whenever we realize that things do go according to the plan of God. And if we would just rest in God's providence and what God is doing in our hearts and lives, if we would rest in God doing right according to His will in our lives, all things, can I tell you, we'll leave, lead a happier life. And so Jesus Christ confirmed to His disciples that He was who He said He was and that He did what He said He did according to the Scriptures. But notice the second things. In this meeting, there was a confirmation to His disciples. But notice the second thing we find here is a commission that's given to His church. Now, in verse number 45 and 47, we see this, the particulars of this commission. In verse number 45, the Bible says, Then opened he their understanding uh, that, that, that they might understand the Scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And notice, here's the commission, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Notice the particulars of this commission. First of all, there's the gospel. There's the suffering of Christ mentioned in verse number 46. And there's the resurrection. On the third day according to verse number 6 That is the gospel Jesus coming, bleeding, dying uh, And rising again from the grave Hey that is the message of the gospel But this message must be taken Where does this message taken to? The Bible says And that repentance and remission The word remission there Simply means forgiveness A pardon and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name. Where? Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so notice the Lord is giving this uh, group of disciples a commission that they're to take the whole gospel into the whole world. Notice not only the particulars of this commission. Notice the personnel of this commission. Verse number 48, 
Jesus says to them, and ye are witnesses of these things. Who are the ye? We'll go to Acts chapter number 1 and you'll find the ye that he's talking to. In Acts chapter number 1, you find this group of disciples. They're, <coughs> excuse me, they're gathered together in an upper room. And look what verse number 15 says. They were there praying, seeking the face of the Lord, being obedient to Christ, waiting in Jerusalem until the Spirit of God would be sent their way. <coughs> look at verse 15. It says, in, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of his disciples and said, The number of names together were about a hundred and twenty. This is Christ's church. There are 120 disciples that are gathered together in that place. About 120. It was men, and according to the scripture, you'll find as well that there were ladies that were there in that congregation praying. And so you can be sure that there were men, ladies, and there were children there. And the Bible says there were, there were about 120. So Christ, if you will, church there at Jerusalem began uh, with 120 folks. Who are the ye that Jesus is talking to in verse number 48? I believe it's the same group that we read about in Acts chapter number 1. One and verse number 15. I believe that this is Christ's church and I believe that these are they who attended that prayer meeting in Acts 1.15 and I believe there were about 120 people that made up this congregation. Now here's where I want to go this morning. We see the particulars of, the, of this commission, the personnel of this commission, but notice there's a third part. There's a perplexity of this commission. You say, what is that? Well, look back at verse number 47. Would you notice with me, and that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in His name among how many nations? All nations, beginning at Jerusalem. But notice this, and ye are witnesses of these things. Who are the ye? About 120 folks. Here's the perplexity. God's commission is this, that the message of the death, burial, and resurrection, the message of repentance and remissions of sins, that it would go into the entire world. What a perplexing situation because you only have about 120 people that Christ is speaking to, to whom he gave that commission. Now, in my mind, I began to think, how in the world are 120 people going to be able to go into the entire world and preach the gospel to every creature as many mentioned in Mark 16, 15, and also here in John or Luke chapter number 47. How in the world is 120 men, women, and children going to take that gospel message into the entire world? I could imagine as this small group heard this commission. I could imagine them thinking in their mind, how is this possible? I know that when we read the Bible, we think of Peter and James and John and those men, and we think of them as super Christians that never have doubts or problems, but they're always faithful. But I want to tell you this, those men are just like you and I this morning. And in my mind, I could imagine them thinking, how in the world are we going to take this message into the entire world? How are we going to take this gospel into all nations? How are we going to do this? How are we going to make missions possible? How is this even going to be possible? 120 all nations of the world. You know, not only is this a question for those 120, but that's a question for all of us today, even our church. How are we going to take the gospel to all nations? I looked up, and according to the United States, uh, there's 196 nations in this world. Think about that, 196 nations. There's 7.82 billion people in this world. How are we going to make missions possible? You understand God gave us a commission to go into the entire world. How are we going to take all the gospel into all the world? How are we going to be able to do that? How are you and I going to make missions possible? Now, I believe that there's some ways that you and I can make missions possible. And I want to show that to you this morning. Number one, we can make missions possible. Number one, if we simply have eyes that see. Go to John chapter number 4. The gospel of John chapter number 4. We can make missions possible. Number one, if we will have eyes that see. What do we see? Well, we have to see what Jesus sees. John 4 and look at verse number 35. The gospel of John chapter number 4. And verse number 35. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And in verse 35, he says this, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, 
I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to be har- to the harvest. So in verse number 35, Jesus instructs his disciples, hey, the same ones that he's going to be speaking to there at the end of the gospel of Luke, and he instructs them and he says this, hey, if we're going to reach the world, the first thing that must happen is this, we've got to have eyes that see. We've got to look on the fields and understand uh, that it's reaping time right now. You hear people all the time saying that America is a hard field. You hear people talk about foreign countries as a hard field. I don't know of any field that's necessarily easy. But according to John chapter 4 and verse number 35, that the field is white already to harvest. Hey, we need to see the opportunity that we have right now while there's still time. Hey, there are men, women, boys and girls that are going to step off into eternity at any moment. There are people in our in our uh, county. There are people in our country. And there are people in the entire world that are going to die today. According to statistics, there's about two people that die every second uh, in the world. And every two people that die without Jesus Christ, can I tell you, without exception, they'll die and they'll go to a devil's hell. And it's our responsibility, hey, to look out and look at others and look at their need for salvation. Hey, the field is white already to harvest right now. Hey, we've got so little time. We don't have much time left. Hey, can I tell you, Jesus could call us home at any moment. Hey, he could uh, step on, we could, uh, he could step in the clouds at any moment. Hey, the trump can sound at any moment. The dead in Christ shall rise at any moment. And our opportunity to win the loss is going to be gone at a moment's notice. Hey, it's time. It's time. Don't say that the fields are too hard. Look up, lift up your eyes and look on the field. According to Jesus, they're white already to harvest. A white harvest is, will become a perishing harvest if somebody doesn't get to the field and get to work. First off, we've got to look. We've got to have eyes that see. See the opportunity to reap. Don't look at all the obstacles in reaping. Don't look at all the labor that has to go forth in reaping. Don't look at all the problems that you'll have because you're trying to reap. But look at the opportunity that we have to reap the gospel, reap souls for the gospel. We got to have eyes to see. Lamentations 3:51. Jeremiah is looking on the ruined ashes of the city of Jerusalem. They call him the weeping prophet because as he was looking on the ashes, tears were flowing down his cheeks. If you read the book of Lamentations, what you find is a eulogy of a nation that turned from the Lord what you find. Here's a man mourning. He's having a funeral, if you will, for the city of Jerusalem and the inhabitants thereof. And you find him sitting there and his heart is broken. Lamentations 3.51 says, Mine eye affecteth mine heart. You say, Pastor, I don't have a burden for the lost. Well, lift up your eyes. Look on the field. They're white all ready to harvest. Let what you see affect your heart. Understand that people are perishing day by day. And let the truth of that not just uh, affect you in the sense where you want to get the missionaries around the world, but let that affect you right here. Let your heart be broken for the field in which God has placed us in. And let's not worry about the sunshine that beats down upon our head. Let us not worry about the rain that would come. Let's not worry about the snow, if you will. Let's not worry about all these things that would hinder us from doing the work of God. But let's look on the field and look at the need and get busy reaping for the master we can make missions possible number one if we have eyes that see number two we can make missions possible if we have hands that give go to Philippians chapter 4 would you look at verse number 10 the book of Philippians chapter 4 we've got to have eyes that see but number two we need to have hands that give Philippians chapter number 4 Philippians chapter number 4, jump down to verse number 10. Someone once wrote this, If I refuse to give to missions this year, I practically cast a ballot in favor of the recall of every missionary. If I refuse to give to missions, I am actively voting to have every missionary come home from the field. I know this, that if we had missionaries that had no support, they would still go. 
But how much better it would be if we would be co-laborers with them so that they can go. Notice here in Philippians chapter 4, we're talking about hands that give. In verse number 10 of Philippians 4, you see the contentment of the missionary. The Bible says in verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you lacked, uh, where, wherein you all were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how both to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know what the all things through Christ in verse 13 has to do with? It has to do with contentment. That's the direct context. And here you find that uh, Paul is writing to this church that supported him uh, financially. And notice he says that he's content. Whether he has much or he has little, he says here that he is content. You know, most missionaries figure the cost of living in a foreign country and they seek to raise it. But I will tell you this, most missionaries that I know, they go under-supported. They go under-supported. Why? Because folks won't give and... Folks won't support. And so they see that with their eyes, they see their field. They see men and women that are perishing. And they say, well, if we have to go without food, if we have to go without this or that, hey, we're willing to go and hazard our life for the gospel. Hey, there are missionaries that go to the field with not enough to sustain them and their family. And they just have faith that God would take care of them. And I commend every missionary that has that kind of zeal. But can I tell you this? It ought not be. It ought not be. Notice the contentment of the missionary. Number two, notice the communication of the church. Verse 14, the Bible says, Notwithstanding ye have done well, that ye did communicate with my afflictions. Now what does he mean? That you communicated with me in my afflictions. Well, it's not talking about that they just wrote him a letter. He said, you communicated with me in my afflictions. What does this mean? Well, look at verse number 15. He explains it. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Do you see? Communication here deals with giving and receiving. The church giving and Paul receiving. That's what it deals with here. And he said, whenever I started out uh, to preach the gospel in regions beyond, and I started out there in Macedonia, hey, there was no church that wanted to take care of my needs or help me as a missionary. But he says here, hey, you communicated with me. You gave so that I could have. Hey, when I was having need, you sent once again to my necessity. Hey, you've tried to take care of me. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He said, once and again, every time I had need, it just seemed like you knew I had a need and you just sent me exactly what I needed. You know, it's a blessing for a church to be a giving church. It's a blessing to have a church that loves missionaries and gives to them. That is an unselfish church. And I believe that's a church God can bless. You want to dry up a church? Then stop supporting missions and missionaries. You want to dry up a church and destroy a church? Lose the evangelistic zeal that a church ought to have. Hey, you want to destroy a work? Hey, then quit communicating with the missionaries in their needs. Hey, that'll destroy a church in a heartbeat. So this church at Philippi, great church, and they took care of Paul. You say, I thought Paul was an apostle. He was. But what work was Paul doing? He was doing what we would call modern missions. He is a missionary. Yes, he's an apostle, but he's going to regions beyond with the gospel. Not where the gospel was preached, but in a field where the gospel had not been preached. He was not building upon another man's labor. He left left Israel and he went to Macedonia. Hey, he went went west with the gospel. Let me say this. Thank God he went west. Because without him going west, we'd be lost. He took the gospel by the leadership of the Spirit of God and he went west. And you and I are still uh, seeing fruit. We are fruit, rather, of Paul's missionary uh, expansion westward. Because as the gospel kept going western and western and western, guess what happened? It came to America and you and I were able to hear it and get saved. Hey, we're debtors. But a church must communicate with missions. 
sometimes is communication is not easy. I remember years ago, we had a missionary come through, and not here, but it was years ago, and he was talking about the field and the great need uh, for money for Bibles and, and just gospel tracts and just all the different things. And there was a visitor that came into our church and sat in the back. And missionaries, a lot of missionaries will stop and let people ask questions. I don't have problems with that. Uh, but sometimes people can ask and say stupid things. And the lady said, with so many needy in America, why don't we take this missions money and support the needy and feed the poor? That's what she said. And I felt so bad for the missionary. I felt so bad for the missionary. Because it, may, it was making him sound like he was only after money. And it, I could tell it, it really bothered the missionary. You know, after when Sunday school was closed and I came up and I closed it, I answered the lady. She spoke out. So I answered the lady. I said, you can, feed a, you can feed a body and that body will still die and go to hell. But you can give them the gospel and that soul can live forever. And I said, that's why we do it. I said, yes, we believe in feeding the poor and being a blessing. I believe we ought to do that. But at the same time, we cannot neglect the harvest field. And friend, I want to tell you, a church must communicate. We must be willing to give of ourselves. And yes, even if we have to sacrifice. You say, Pastor, I don't have much to, in order to give to missions. You know, the Lord doesn't expect us to give much if we have, don't have much. Remember the widow's mite? You remember that story? All she had was those two mites and she dropped it in. Jesus, the Bible says, was beholding what they were doing. And they were, I'm sure people were coming in. They were dropping their money in. And the apostles probably looking around. Man, look how much money they got. Look how much. And they may have been impressed by all the means of some that came in. But that's not what impressed the Lord. It was this little lady that came in. She had two mites. And she dropped in. Here's what Jesus said. She gave more than they all. It's not accepted about what you don't have. It's accepted about what you do have. God doesn't expect you to do something with what you don't have. He expects you to do something with what you do have. He doesn't expect you to do that which you cannot do. But He does expect you to do what you can do. What I'm saying is this. If we want to make missions possible, we need to have eyes to see. But number two, we need to have hands that give. So here's the contentment of the missionary. Then the communication of the church. But look at verse 18 and 19. Here's the commendation of the Lord. Now notice the Lord is going to commend. Uh, we're going to see the commending of the, of the church uh, before the Lord. Verse 18 it says, But I have all, and abound, and am full, having received of Epaphrodites the things which were sent from you. What a blessing. This church met the need of Paul. The Lord used them, and now Paul said, I am full, having received of Epaphrodites that which you've sent. Paul said, I have all I need now. I'm full. But notice what it goes on to say. This offering says an odor of the sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to who? To God. Paul didn't say it's well-pleasing to me. And by the way, I'm sure it was well-pleasing to him because he got help that he needed. But he said this is well-pleasing to God. Now notice the commending of the Lord here. Look at verse number 18. Well, how is God going to react to this congregation? Remember, the churches of Macedonia, they gave out of their poverty, not out of their wealth. That's what we learn about uh, in 2 Corinthians, right? They gave out of their poverty, not out of their wealth. Here's what Paul says is going to happen because this church was faithful in helping this missionary. Verse 19, but. That but connects to verse number 18 and verse number 17 and verse number 16, verse number 15. Contextually, that's what he's dealing with. He said, but my God shall supply all your need. Wait a minute, this church had need. You see Paul admitting that? This church has need. Paul's looking at this offering in his mind. He knows that this church in Macedonia, this uh, church at Philippi, they had great need financially. And he said, but my God's going to supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know what the Lord's saying? The Lord's saying, here, I'm going to take care of that church. I'm going to make sure that church has everything it needs. And aren't you thankful for the promise of God? That God's supply is greater than our need? And here's how we open up that supply. We see a missionary that's suffering, we give. My pastor would say this. He said, church trouble? He says, church getting fat? Speaking of issues in the church? 
Is there church trouble? Is the church fat due to clogged arteries? He says, here's how you cure that. Put the church on a mission diet. The little church I grew up in was a small church. About 100 people, maybe 120 in its heyday. But that little church would give over $5,000 a month to missions. On top of that, they would support their preacher boys that go off to Bible college. They help them out. Hey, a preacher's going to study to be in the ministry, to be a pastor, a missionary evangelist, that church would help them. And it was an amazing thing. You know what God did to that church? God supplied over and over and over again. The church wasn't a wealthy church, but every time the church needed something, God always provided in abundance. Not only that, there was a lot of preacher boys that went out of the church I grew up in. I'm not the only one. You know, I think God blesses a church with a missions heart and hands that will give to missionaries. Can I give you this? Number three, we can make missions possible. If we have eyes that see, hands that give. But number three, we can make missions possible if we'll have knees that bend. Our hands may not be able to give so that everyone can go into all the world. But we can go, through, we can go into all the world through the avenue of prayer. We may not be able to support every missionary that comes through. We pray and we try to support all that we can. But you know what we can do? Though we can't support every missionary, we sure can pray. Missionary last week said he needed our prayers. And I know some people think, no, you just need our money. No, they need our prayers. Because that which we can't supply, God still can. And so we're to pray. And we're to pray for them. Go, to, uh, go with me, please. Let's jump. Um, let's go to... 2 Corinthians 1.11. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5.25. 1 Thessalonians 5, Brethren, pray for us. In Hebrews 13.18, he said it again. Pray for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 11. Paul says this. Ye also helping together... By prayer for us. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may, abound, may uh, be given by many on their behalf. But do you notice what he says at the beginning? Your helpers together by prayer. Hey, we can be a co-laborer with missionaries by simply praying. Think about it. There's 196 nations in this world. We support 27 missionaries. How are we going to fulfill the Great Commission? Well, I believe we can help fulfill the Great Commission into all the world if we'll pray. We'll pray. You'll notice in our bulletin, you'll notice that we are, are on our, on our uh, not the bulletin, I didn't put it in there, but on our slide, that we have a mission field of the week now. You'll notice if you saw the slide, looked at the slides, I know sometimes they become just a blur to us. But it'll be in the bulletin next week too. But we're now going to start praying for mission, the mission field of the week. This week's missions field is this. It's China. That's the country we're praying for. We're going to pray for. We're going to pray for China that God would raise up missionaries to go. We don't have a missionary in China, but there needs to be a missionary in China. The Lord says pray to the Lord of harvest, right? So let's pray that God raise up missionaries to go. And what I'm saying is this. We may not be able to go with our feet, but we can go on our knees. We can pray. We can pray that God would raise up labors, that God would send forth labors into His harvest. Hey, the field's already wide unto harvest, and God needs us to call and to pray and beg Him to send forth more labors into the field. Let me give you this last thing, and we'll be done. We can make missions possible if we have eyes that see, hands that give, knees that bend, but also, number four, feet. That go. Look at Romans chapter number 10, please. You know the verses I'm going to. But go to Romans chapter number 10. We're just about done. You've listened well this morning, but don't let this, don't let this fall on deaf ears either. Romans 10, look at verse number 13. Verse 13 probably is one of the most precious verses to me in all the scripture because the Lord used verse number 13. To give me full assurance of my salvation. You remember I told you I doubted being saved after I was saved. I even made another 
profession of faith, got rebaptized again, but the doubt stayed. I did all that, and the doubt stayed. And I remember saying, Lord, something's wrong. You want me to know, according to 1 John, that I'm saved or not. Why don't I know I'm saved? And so I wasn't very smart, but I knew I could go to the book of Romans, and Romans was a book of salvation. I could go through the Romans road, and I could look at that to see if I was saved. And I remember I was on that little trailer, and I was in my room in a little trailer on Elsie Davis Road, sitting on my little bed, and I had the Bible, and I was going through the Romans road, for all of sin had come short of the glory of God. And I remember thinking, when I, when I called on the Lord, I remember thinking that I was a sinner and I was going to hell. And I just went all the way through it. Jesus, uh, but God commended his love to us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I said, whenever I, got, whenever I prayed that time, I remember I really believed that Jesus died for my sin. That he was buried and rose again. And then when I got to Romans 10, 13, and I read verse 13, it was like a flood of peace. Just, I mean, it just came over my soul. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, doesn't say might be saved, it says shall be saved. Man, God just gave me peace of my salvation. I've not had to doubt since because of that. That's a precious verse. And that is a true verse. That's an important verse. But let's go on to see how, what, how that relates to the scripture that follows it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? If they don't believe Jesus really died, lived, died, buried, rose again, how are they going to call on him? They're not going to call if they don't believe, right? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? If they never hear of Jesus, how are they going to believe on Jesus and then call on Jesus? Now, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Preacher is just a messenger. Somebody to go with the gospel. Verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring good tid- uh, uh, glad tidings of good things. So notice what the Bible says here. It talks about the feet. Why the feet? Because the feet is that which carries the person with the gospel. And the Bible says those that carry the gospel, they have beautiful feet. And what I'm simply saying this morning is this, that if we're going to make missions possible then we must go ourselves the greatest need of the hour is not money it's manpower all have been commissioned by our Lord to missionary work don't miss that all have been commissioned to missionary work missionaries are not just those that cross the sea one said but those that see the cross and take the cross to the lost you're either a missionary to some foreign land Or you're called to be a missionary in your own fatherland. You're either called to go or you're called to stay. And no matter whether you go or whether you stay, you have a work that is supposed to be done. And we're to go with the gospel. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. What do we teach them? The gospel. Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 28, 48, and ye, these are believers, ye are witnesses of these things. John 20, 21, we find Christ saying to these the same group, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Acts 1, 8 says, ye shall be witnesses unto me. And what I'm simply saying is this, this is the Lord's last, uh, last words to his church. The very last things that he said was about the great commission and our our Lord's last command should be our first concern. We ought to be concerned about the souls of men so that we'll go and we'll tell someone how to be saved. Take the gospel. You may not can speak well, but you can hand out a gospel track. You say, do people get saved by reading gospel tracks? Yes. People can get saved by reading a gospel track. You know why? Because on that gospel track is the gospel. And it shows them how to apply the gospel to their heart. You don't need another standing in front of you. Though that's helpful. But a gospel track can get into a home. It can get into places you and I cannot get. Do you give out gospel tracks? Do you ever witness with your lips of the resurrected Lord? Hey, we have a responsibility. If we supported a missionary that didn't do the job, the mission work, we would withdraw support wouldn't we but why do we expect our missionaries to do more than what we are willing to do we've got to have feet to go maybe this morning God's dealing with your heart about being a missionary that's possible 
Remember I told you about Hudson Taylor last uh, week before last, how as a five-year-old boy he committed his heart to be a missionary. You say, can five-year-olds make that decision? Yes. Remember Hudson Taylor went as a missionary to China and did a wonderful work over there bringing uh, people to Christ. Hey, and he had that call as a young boy and he took that call and lived by that call and served Christ. What I'm saying is this. Hey, maybe God is calling you this morning. Hey, don't, uh, don't close your ears to the call of God, but say as Isaiah did, here am I, send me. Hey, have that spirit. But if God chooses not to send you across the sea, I can tell you He's chosen to send you across the street. Where to go with the gospel. See, we talk about, oftentimes talk about missions as very abstract. We think about all the people that are going in missions to foreign lands. But can I tell you, missions and mission work is not abstract. It's very tangible. And you know what? It's available for you to be part of mission work. If you can't go, God's called you to stay. And you need to be busy taking the gospel yourself to those that know not Christ. Listen, we can make missions possible. We can do it. Christ would not give us a command we could not fulfill. So let's endeavor to do everything we can to keep a soul out of hell. Because people are perishing day by day. Matthew 9, 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. John Rice wrote this. The harvest white, with reapers few, is wasting. And many souls will die and never know. The love of Christ, the joy of sins forgiving. Oh, let us weep and love and pray and go. Today we reap or we miss our golden harvest. Today has given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Oh, will you go and bring some sinner in? The only thing we're taking to heaven with us are the souls of the men and women, boys and girls that we lead to Christ. Did not Paul say that to that church, that year of my crown of rejoicing in the presence of the Lord Jesus? Hey, that's what we're taking with us. That's what's important. Will you be a part of making missions possible? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these folks that are here. I so appreciate how you even spoke to my heart this morning. And Lord, I'm thankful that, yes, you've given us a command, but Lord, you've given us power that we can do what you'd have us do. And Father, I just pray that you might Allow your grace to be seen in our congregation. Lord, that we would do these things. God, that we would, Lord, yes, have hands that give. Yes, Lord, have knees that bend. Yes, have eyes to see. And Lord, yes, have feet that are willing to go. Lord, please, what a blessing it would be that you would reach down in our congregation And you would put someone on the mission field from this place. What a blessing it would be if our folks would get a greater burden for the souls of men. What a blessing it would be if we would seek to, as the maniac, to tell those, our friends and our families, of the Christ that's able to make a difference in their life. But Lord, please, give us a burden. God, give us a heart for missions. God, please. Lord, be with this invitation. Lord, if you've spoken to hearts, I pray that they would be careful to respond back to you. Whatever you might have said to them, I pray that they would be uh, wise enough and honest enough to speak to you about those things. And Lord, be with this invitation. If there's one lost, help them to come to know Christ today before it's eternally too late. Lord, the gospel that can save that one in the deepest part of Africa is the same gospel that can save whoever's here Uh, in this room this morning. Lord, please, please do a work in this place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Kevin's going to play. If God's spoken to your heart, you can come to an altar. Let's stand together, please. God's spoken to you. you.